for how many years it's been since I first read Neuromancer. I think I discovered it about the time Bill's second book came out, so I got to have the pleasure of reading two at once, and of course I was going, where's the rest of this? Uh, thankfully, Bill doesn't take 25 years per book and doesn't write 17 volume sagas. Hard to know my friends are doing this, and I really wish to kick them all in the posterior, but it gets me in trouble when I do this. Like when Brandon Sanderson said he was new series, was going to be ten books, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> the problem is they're all good at it, too, which is the worst part. So they wasn't any good, I could just say, well, I won't bother to read that stuff. Anyway, uh, Bill came out. He would probably just like to call this, but he was one of the founding fathers of Cyberpunk. He has evolved in a way a lot of them never did. Uh, these days, of course, you can argue with that what he's actually writing is actually science fiction. As far as I'm concerned, because that's my section, it definitely is. <laughs> but with the last two books, including Peripheral, uh, I tend to think of them as more as just fun yarns, thrillers, I don't know what to say. They're just lots of fun to pour through and see how much you can figure out what he's doing. Beyond that, please welcome William Gibson. Thank you. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. And so this is the, the first reading of uh, From the Peripheral in a Bookstore. And the Peripheral, uh, but I've already discovered, because I've done a, a couple of, of readings, is a difficult book to do a reading from because it has... Oh, let me see. That's 124 really short chapters. <laughs> and they alternate, they alternate points of view between two very different, very different characters. And none of it makes any sense at all. <laughs> Taken, taken out of, of context. But with, with that said, I, I'm, I'm going to read successive, you know, one successive, uh, like I'm going to read successive chapters from each, each point of view, just because I, I need the uh, to practice. <laughs> I'm going to have to do this for the next 20 days. <laughs> and <clears throat> I may even read three. These are so, these are so short. So chapter 10 is called The, the Maynad's Crush. And if you know your Maynads, you know you don't want one to get a crush on you. And this is, this is from the point of view of an alcoholic publicist in, in London named Wilf Netherton. And we, we won't, he's in London, but we won't say anything about when he is. And the place was a drinking closet for tourists, Netherton supposed a walled-in 1830s archway in a corner of the lower level of Covent Garden. Staffed by a lone mishikoid, he kept expecting to erupt in targeting devices. There was a full-sized, vigorously authentic-looking pub sign depicting what he took to be main ads, a number of them, mounted above a bar long enough for four stools and the curtain snug where he now sat, awaiting rainy. He'd never seen another customer in the place, which was why he'd suggested it. The curtain, thick burgundy velour, moved. A child's eye appeared, hazel under pale bangs. Rainy, he asked, though certain it was her. Sorry, the child said, slipping in. They didn't have anything in adult. 
something popular at the opera tonight, so everything in the neighborhood's taken. He imagined her now stretched on a couch in her elongated Toronto apartment, a bridge across an avenue diagonally connecting two older towers. She'd be wearing a headband to trick her nervous system into believing the rented peripherals movements were hers in a dream. I'm right off Michicoids, she said, looking 10, perhaps younger, and in the way of many such rentals, like no one in particular. Watch the one from the Moby, she said, while it was guarding Daedra, nasty. Move like spiders when they need to. She took the chair opposite his, regarded him glumly. Where is she? she asked. No telling, he said. Oh, where is she? he asked. No telling, she said. Her government sent in some kind of aircraft, but of course they blanked the extraction, ordered the Moby away. But you could still watch, he asked. Not the extraction, she said, but everything else. Big guy down on his face, the rest of them sliced and diced. No more of them turned up, so no more casualties. Good for us in theory, assuming the project, the project in any way continues. Would your friend care for something, sir? The Michikoid asked from beyond the curtain. No, he said, as there was no point in putting good liquor into a peripheral. Not that this place had any. He's my uncle, she said loudly. Really? You suggested we meet this way, Netherton reminded her. He took a sip of their least expensive whiskey, identical to their most expensive, which he'd sampled while waiting for her. Shit, she said, small hand gesturing to encompass their situation. Lots of it now, hitting many fans, large ones. Rainey was employed, as he understood it, by the Canadian government, though they were no doubt hermetically walled off from any responsibility for her actions. He considered this to be an arrangement of quite startlingly naked simplicity, in that she probably did know, at least approximately, who her superiors were. Can you be more specific, he asked her. Saudis are out, she said. He'd been expecting it. Singapore is out, she continued. Our half dozen largest Ingos. Out, he asked. The child's head nodded. France, Denmark. Who's left, he asked. The United States, she said, and a faction of the government of New Zealand. He sipped the whiskey, its small tongue of fire on his. She tilted her head, considered to have been an assassination, she said. That's absurd. What we hear, we who. Don't ask. I don't believe it. Wilf, said the child, leaning forward. That was a hit. Someone used us to help kill him, not to mention his entourage. Daedra had a significant percentage in any successful outcome. Aside from that, what's happened can't be good for her, he said. Self-defense, Wilf. Easiest spin on earth. You and I know that she wanted to provoke them. She needed an excuse to make it self-defense. But she was always going to be the contact figure, wasn't she, he said. She was already part of the package when you signed on, wasn't she? She nodded. Then you hired me, he said. Who brought her in in the first place? These questions, she said, the child's diction growing more precise, 
suggests that you don't understand our situation. Neither of us can afford any interest in the answer to questions like those. We're going to take a hit on this one, Wilf, professionally, but that she left it unfinished. He looked into the rental's still eyes. Is better than being the object of, of another one, he asked. We neither know, the child said firmly, nor desire to know. He looked at the whiskey. They had her covered with a hypersonic weapon delivery system, he said, didn't they? Something orbital, ready to drop in. But they would, her government, she said. They're American. It's what they do. But we shouldn't even be discussing this now. It's over. We both need it to be over now. He looked at her. It could be worse, she said. It could, he asked. You're still sitting here, the child said. I'm home, all warm in my jammies. We're alive and about to be looking for work, I imagine. Let's keep it that way, shall we? He nodded. This would probably be a little less complicated, the child said, if you hadn't had a sexual relationship with her. But that was brief and is over. It is over, isn't it, Wilf? Of course, he said. No loose ends, she asked. Didn't leave your shaving kit? Because we need it over, Wilf, really. We need there to be no reason at all that you ever have to communicate with her again. And then he remembered. But he could fix it. No need to tell Rainy. He reached for the whiskey. And somewhere, somewhere else, <laughs> The, this, this is sequentially the next chapter, and it's called Tarantula. And the point of view character in this one is, is named Flynn Fisher. And Flynn is going in this chapter is, is after a long, weird night doing something else, is, is going, going to visit her sometime employee and she's got some stuff she has to, has to find out about. Locked her bike in the alley and used her phone to let herself into the back of Forever Fab, smelling pancakes and the shrimp rice bowl special from Sushi Barn. Pancakes meant they were printing with that plastic you could compost. Shrimp special was Shailene's midnight snack. Edward was on a stool in the middle of the room, monitoring. He wore sunglasses against the flashes of UV with his viz behind the glasses on one side. In the low light, the glasses looked the same color as his face, but shinier. Seen Macon, she asked. No Macon near comatose with boredom and the hour. You want a break, Edward? I'm okay, he said. She glanced at the long work table stacked with jobs needing removal of afterbirth, smoothing, assembly. She'd spent a lot of hours at that table. Shailene was a solid source of casual employment if you got along with her and were quick with your hands. Looked like they were printing toys tonight or maybe decorations for the fourth. She went into the front, found Shailene watching the news, ugly spirited sign carriers there. Shailene looked up. You hear from Burton, she asked. No, Flynn lied. What's happening? Didn't want to have the Burton conversation. Odds of avoiding it were zero. Homeland took some vets away, Shailene said. I'm worried about him. Got Edward to sub for you. 
I saw him, Flynn said. You want breakfast? You're up early, Shailene said. Haven't slept. She hadn't said what it was she needed to do, wouldn't now. You seen Macon? Shailene flicked through the display with a fancy resin nail, loop four or five tumbling back into the green of some imaginary savanna. Wasn't that kind of night, she said, meaning she'd pitched the all-nighter because there was excess work to be done, not because Macon needed peace and quiet to fab his funnies. Flynn wasn't sure how much of Fab's income was funny, but assumed a good part of it was. There was a Fabit franchise a mile down the highway with bigger printers, more kinds, but you didn't do anything funny at Fabit. I'm dieting, Shailene said. Flamingos rose from the savannah. Is that why the purple, Flynn asked? Burton, Shailene said, standing, slipping a finger to tug at the waist of her jeans. Burton can take care of himself, Flynn said. The VA aren't doing shit, Shailene said, to help him recover. What Shailene saw as Burton's primary symptom of traumatic stress, Flynn thought, was his ongoing failure to ask her out. Shailene sighed that Flynn didn't get it, how her brother was. Shailene had big hair without actually having it, Flynn's mother once said. Something that came up through any remake like marker ink through latex paint. Flynn liked her except for the Burton thing. You see Macon, Flynn said, ask him to get in touch with me. Need some help with my phone. Starting to turn to go. Sorry, I'm a bitch, Shailene said. Flynn squeezed her shoulder. Let you know as soon as I hear from him. Let herself out the back with a nod to Edward. Connor Pinsky blew past on his tarantula as she was turning out of the alley behind Fab. What was left of him, a jagged black scrawl behind the two front wheels. Janet sewed him these multi-zippered sock-like things out of black polar tech. They looked, as Janet worked on them, like fitted cases for something you couldn't imagine, which Flynn guessed they were. Town's only other happed wreck vet. He'd come back in one of the ways she'd been scared Burton would. Minus a leg, the foot of the other one, the arm on the opposite side, and the thumb and two fingers of the remaining hand. Handsome face unscarred, which made it weirder. She smelled recycled fried chicken fat hanging in the trike's exhaust trail as the single huge rear slick vanished down Baker Way. He rode at night, mostly county roads, this county and the next two or three over, steering with a servo rig the VA paid for. She figured he got loose that way, basically didn't stop until the fuel was running out, hooked up to a Texas catheter and high on something wakey. Slept all, all day if he could. Burton helped him out at home sometimes. He made her sad, a sweet boy in high school for all he'd been that good looking. Neither he nor Burton ever said anything to anyone that she knew of about what had happened to him. She rode to Jimmy's, letting the hub do most of the work. Went in and sat at the counter, ordered eggs and bacon and toast, no coffee. In the red bull mirror behind the counter, the cartoon bull noticed her, winked. She dodged eye contact. She hated it when they spoke to you, called you by your name. That mirror was the newest thing in Jimmy's, a place that had been old when her mother had gone to high school. 
Everything old in Jimmy's had at some point been painted in one or another generation of dark, shiny brown, including the floor. The onions were starting to sizzle for the lunch dogs, stung her eyes. She'd have the smell in her hair. Hefty Mart would be open. She'd walk up and down the aisles while forklifts brought in shrink-wrapped pallets. She liked it in there early. She'd spent one of her shiny new fives on two bags of groceries. That's $5,000. Things that would keep in the cupboard. The neighbors had all gr grown more vegetables than they knew what to do with out of a random stretch of rain. Then she'd go by Pharma John and put another five against her mother's prescriptions. Then ride home, get the panniers unloaded, contents into the pantry, lucky if she didn't wake anybody but the cat. The edge of the counter was trimmed with LEDs like the ones in Burton's trailer under a sloppier application of polymer. She had never seen them on, but it, had at le but it had been at least a year since she'd been in here with the place in bar mode. She pressed the polymer with her thumb, feeling it give. Burton and Leon, before they enlisted, learned you could use a syringe to inject this same stuff, still liquid, into the part of a shotgun shell that held the shot then quickly epoxy over the hole you'd made. The polymer stayed wet in there most of the time anyway between the little lead balls so it didn't expand. When you fired one, it solidified as the shot left the barrel, producing a weird potato-shaped lump of polymer and lead, so slow that you could almost see it tumble out of the barrel. Heavy, elastic, they'd bounce these off the concrete walls and ceiling in the county storm shelter, trying to hit things around corners. Leon had gotten keys to the place. Looked weird when you weren't in there with everybody else hiding from a tornado. Burton, after a while, actually could hit things around corners, but the sound of the Mossberg hurt her ears, even with earplugs. Burton had been different then, not just skinny or gangly, which seemed impossible now, but messy. She'd noticed the night before how everything she hadn't touched in the trailer was perfectly squared up with the edge of something else. Leon said the core had turned Burton into a neat freak, but she hadn't really thought about it before. She reminded herself to take that empty Red Bull can out to the recyc bin, spend some time straightening the trailer up. Girl brought her eggs. She heard Connor's trike pass again, out beyond the parking lot. Nothing else on the road sounded like that. Police pretty much gave him a pass because he ran mostly late at night. She hoped he was on his way home. I think that's good. That's a good. That's a place to stop. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I can I can attempt to answer answer some questions, and then I will sign books. Yes. Is there any technology or fashion which sounds fictional but is real? Oh, I'm sure there is. I, I mean, I hardly, I hardly bother to distinguish. I mean, everything, everything in this book and every other science fiction book that anybody's ever written is made up out of little bits and pieces of the world that have just been like stirred around and had glitter or something thrown, <laughs> thrown on them. It's not like anyone ever has any way to pull in something that has totally no connection to to any anything else and these days i think like originality 
and SF is, is about, it's a, it's a very recombinant thing, and perhaps it, it always has been. Yes? Oh, I basically, I, I start to run out of money. <laughs> uh, and so after, after I publish a book, I live, in effect, like a normal human, except for not doing anything to make a, make a living. <laughs> And then when it becomes time, you know, time to write a, write a book, I get a, a contract to, to write a book, and then I begin to procrastinate. <laughs> and after a, a, a certain painful amount of, of procrastination, I commence, commence the, the actual process of of, write, of writing the book, and which is like kind of indescribably horrible. <laughs> and it totally hasn't gotten any any better. And this book was really hard. This book was really hard to write, and I couldn't figure out why. It was really really worrying me. But having having actually finally managed to finish it, I realize that the thing that's hard about it is that it's the first imagined future that I've done, future stuff that I've done in this century. Because for me this century was, or rather, you know, well, the 14 years of this century so far went, went by doing the, the big end books, as I guess they're, I guess they're, they're called, which were speculative novels of the very recent past. They were all each set in the year prior to their, their publication, although some people never noticed that and assumed they were set in the future, which was kind of a test. <laughs> uh, on my part, but I hadn't actually plugged in the, the future making thing for a long time and it was, not only was it rusty, but I had like 14 years of stuff to, stuff to shovel into it and when stuff started co coming out the, the other end, I was like, holy shit, this is grim. <laughs> <laughs> These people from, you know, the guys in Chiba City would, would uh, shit themselves to wind up, wind up in, in the futures of, of this, this book. Yeah, I, actually, they would in, in a, lot of, a lot of ways. There are a lot of things that the guys in Chuba City never knew about, like cell phones, <laughs> global warming, things like, things like that. That's it. Yes? I'm still wondering about the sushi barn. <laughs> what do they serve at the sushi barn? They serve, they, they serve sushi made by an apparently Vietnamese guy who's, who's mysteriously called Hong. And I just always thought that, that that would be the worst possible name for a sushi place. <laughs> and I thought that, I thought that it, it uh, I think it was because I once turned down an invitation to a sushi restaurant in Denver. <laughs> and, and that was when I first thought of Sushi Bar, because I had heard some not great things about it. And I thought, what would they call it if it was even, 
even dodgier. It would be it would be sushi bar. Right? But it seems to be. I mean, they make Shailene's shrimp, shrimp rice thing. I thought, doubt if those are shrimp from the ocean. Right? I, I, there, there, there was, there's much I don't know about e either of the worlds depicted, depicted in this thing. Yes. Like when I, I finished it in mid, I finished it in mid July. Like I turned it in in, in mid July, and then I had like like some weeks of doing the editorial business with the with the publisher. And when I finally got it all turned in, I was kind of trying to relax and, and I'd sort of look at the news and look at look at the tw look at Twitter and go, holy shit, that's creepy. <laughs> like, I don't know, it it it, uh, it could just be me, like that I spent so much time such a long time in inside this thing building it so that, that when I come out of it, everything seems creepily resonant of some of the, some of the stuff in, in the book, or maybe it just is creepily resonant of some of the stuff in the book. Yes? Is there going to be more books in the same world? I don't think so. Um, it, for one thing, not to, you know, and it's spoilery of me to say so, there's a, a what we'll call a multiverse potential to, to the narrative. But the potential in science fiction for sequels of something that has multiverse as an ingredient are so inherently cheesy <laughs> that there is a, there would be a risk of retroactively cheesing out the actual product, and I don't want to. Uh, I don't want the responsibility of having to be the person who doesn't, somehow succeeds in not doing that. Like the odds would actually be extraordinarily against doing that, doing that successfully. So I think this is, you know, really my first solo standalone narrative and that the next book will be something be something else. I, I don't want to go back into this and do do anything with it because I was in considerable anxiety about whether or not I would be able to to finish it to more or less to my own own satisfaction. And, and when I got to the end, I found that I had. So I, I don't want to mess that up with appendages. There was, there was actually a, a thing in, in cyberpunk when, when cyberpunk was a thing. Even before it was called cyberpunk, the people people of that tendency, one of the things they spoke of really despairingly in, in the genre SF of the day was sequelitis. And they said, they call them novels because each one's supposed to be novel. <laughs> and you know, there is something, there's something to, there's something to that. As, 
as much as people adore sequels. It's like, you're so spontaneous, don't ever change. <laughs> Yes? Um, now that the, we're not going to have the peripheral reloaded or anything like that, um, <laughs> is there anything like in popular science fiction culture that you're a fan of that may even be cheesy that you're a fan of? Oh, uh, I'm a, like, I'm a native, a native inhabitant of, of science fiction and, and fantasy. It's totally like, it's totally where, where I'm from. But, you know, in the same way that a, a small town in southwestern Virginia is totally where, where I'm from, but I'm somehow not the kind of guy you would otherwise expect to be from a, a small town in Virginia. And it, it's given me, it's given me an, as much as I, I love science fiction, I'm very uncomfortable with the, the very idea of, of genre. I, I've just, in a way, I've always wanted to see, see it all dissolve. Because I've always been more uncomfortable with the I did, uh, well, I could never decide whether I was more uncomfortable with the, the ideas and attitude of people outside the genre looking in or the ideas and attitude of people inside the genre looking out. I always just thought it was just a, a total waste of time to think, to think that way, that it's all just fiction and that people should be able to write anything they want, and it, it's been a, a great uh, pleasure to me to watch the, the, a certain tendency for that in over the course of my career in literature at large for that to happen, to watch the the genre walls dissolve and and the, all the really good stuff about every genre flow together and mix and get unutterably weird and, and give you Lauren Bucus or Dave, David Mitchell or Ned Bowman. And that's the, the, stuff, the stuff that I most, like, I most like to read. But all of my stuff that would be like, like Cheesy stuff? I don't know. I don't, like, I don't know. It would all be really old. Like, it would be like, like, 50, stuff from, stuff from 50 years ago. And I kind of, you know, when I look back, I kind of think that, that I had a taste for the non-cheesy very, very early. And like I found SF all in a pile and rooted through it and found all of the savory morsels. <laughs> yes? Are you in Jack or doing anything with your kind of growing up in the South and then learning the book? Is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about Jack or something? Uh, not, that, not that I know of. He's in some stage of, of writing a, a really intense, not autobiographical, but like a, a history of his rather amazing, rather amazing Kentucky, Kentucky family, or something based on the history of, of his, his family. But it, it's a, a serious undertaking. I, I'm not a memoir kind of guy very, very much. The chemistry of what I do writing fiction is that all that stuff sort of cooks around and bubbles up in, in one hopes unrecognizable forms as crazy fiction. Yes, in the back. Uh, 
I'm like an, I have an anthropological point of view, or I, I try, I try to, and I also try to be uh, as, as non-didactic as, as I can manage. Like I, I was very impressed when I read as an undergraduate E.M. Forster's aspects of the novel and the two ideas that I took away took away from that, and that was before I'd ever written any fiction. One was, one was the idea that we aren't really doing our jobs as writers of fiction as long as we and not the characters are controlling the course of the narrative. I thought that was such a weird idea and, and at first I, it was just something I aspired to, but I actually think with, with, particularly with this book, I, I, finally, I finally got some of that because the Flynn, the, the main protagonist, she would just do shit and I'd go, no, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't even know if that makes any sense, but it would it would change you know change the whole change the whole course course of the story and and there was really like a to an extent that was like a new experience for me and the other <coughs> the other idea of Forster's was that as the professor who taught me Forster simplified it. He said a fascist can never write a good novel because a fascist thinks he knows what's happening. And he's going he's gonna to write a novel in which the characters do things to illustrate whatever dumb shit he thinks <laughs> is happening. And it doesn't matter whether he's a Nazi or a Stalinist. It goes the same. It goes exactly the same way. And and I went, okay, I, I'm going to try not, I'm going to try not to do that. And I, I have pretty much tried, 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 not, tried not to do that. And, and eventually some political, uh, I'm sure, attitude of mine creeps creeps into it, but I try not to make, to be someone who's making didactic illustrations of what I think is right or what I think is wrong. Like what I do happens on some other level that, that is in me that I, I don't, as a, you know, walking around in the world have very much access to. It just happens when I write for, for a long time. And if it didn't surprise me as I do it, I don't think I'd be able to do it. It would be, it would be unbearable. It's like I've written contract screenplays, and when you do a contract screenplay, you have to go in and sit down at a table with these people and say, well, this is what happens, da 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 and this is how it ends. Until you can do that, they're not going to cut you, a, cut you a check. So then you have to go. You go away with that, and and you you write it, and you can't deviate from what you told them it was going to be about. And I found that like so boring, <laughs> and just so excruciating, just absolutely excruciating, that. You know, I, I, I learned that it's something I don't, I don't really like doing. I don't like knowing where it's going when I start. I like to get into this strange kind of drift where I don't know where it's going and I'm, I'm, it's almost like reading. And I don't have to, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a really great thing when it, when it happens. I, I just wish it would happen on a more regular basis with, vac <laughs> you know, with like regular with vacations and you know, weekends off and 
stuff like that. Anyway, I've gone on for really a long time, but, but now I will go wherever I'm supposed to go and sign books. So thank you very much.